I would like to start and report um, to you um, a competition that took place in London in October 2017. It was a discussion, it was a competition between an artificial intelligence and commercial lawyers. Four students from the University of Cambridge, our law school, had programmed an artificial intelligence algorithm and they had organized a competition between this algorithm and commercial lawyers in London. What was the topic of the competition? The topic was to predict cases that had been decided by the financial ombudsman in London. These cases concern consumers complaining that they had been missold payment protection insurance schemes, PPI. PPI is an insurance product that enables consumers to ensure repayment of credit if they face circumstances that may prevent them from repaying a loan. And PPI products were widely sold by banks, hundreds of thousands of them, as an add on to a loan or an overdraft product. So over the week, over one week in October, both the AI algorithm and the London lawyers were presented with facts of such cases. Of course, only the facts and not the decision. There were the lawyers and more than 100 of them um, entered 750, more than 750 predictions on an online platform and the AI algorithm predicted the same number of, uh, of districts. My own role in this was that I was the so-called legal judge, so I made sure that everything was in order, I did the due diligence of the competition, and I essentially signed off that this was a fair competition. 
There was also a technical judge um, who took care of the technical side. So overall, we were happy to say that this was a fair competition and everything was in order. So, who won the competition? Drum roll. The drum roll is like a drum. The door is high. Here we are. The, the, London, the London top boys achieved an accuracy or in the prediction of 62%. Uh, the case crunch technology, that is the name of the AI algorithm, achieved an, accu an accuracy in terms of prediction of 87%. In other words, the lawyers were correct in predicting the outcome of these cases in 62% and the AI was correct in 87% of all cases. At the event in London, we discussed these outcomes and there were many people present. And after we had presented the results, we soon turned to, to, to do other issues. These two issues, in addition to the accuracy, were the issues of costs and time. The lawyers would probably charge a three-figure fee in terms of British pounds for their services, whereas the AI once set up would only charge a fraction or cost a fraction of that amount. Also, a lawyer would probably spend half an hour, maybe a little less, maybe more, but the AI would get the task done in a fraction of that, some seconds, some minutes. The event was widely reported because it was actually the kind of the first type of this competition between, you can say, humans and the machine of this sort. And here you can see what the BBC reported. The headline read, the robot lawyers are here and they are winning. So this pointed out that there is more than accuracy 
So at the end of the training procedure, the AI will have information on which factors are relevant for a consumer to win a case or to lose a case, and also how important such a factor would be for the final outcome. And at this point, then the AI could enter the competition and, when presented with new facts, could very quickly establish whether the consumer would be successful or not. For humans, it is, it is not always clear which factors the AI actually looks at and how important these factors are uh, in establishing the outcome, and this is sometimes called the black box, box effect that represents the fact that it is for the human difficult to see from outside what the AI considers uh, relevant. Now, what does this mean? Now, what does this mean for us when we think about the law, when we research the law, when we study the law? I'm sure you've heard the, the expression law is code and code is law. Usually those two ideas are presented as an in an ad adversarial view, as something that is in opposition. Those who are on the side of the law think that the law should dominate and that the law should say what matters. And that means that law governs computer code. But then there are those who actually think that computers and programs are getting more important than the law. Because the law is lagging behind the code, the law is lagging behind what engineers, computer engineers can achieve, and that means that ultimately code would trump the law. I would like to propose an alternative to this adversarial view that sees law and code as opponent in a struggle for supremacy. Uh, 
chiamata, non fatti i bugiani, non sapete come lo sei, non vuoi dire che si trova. And this is law as code and code as law in a cooperative view. Da realtà è la prima volta che mi trovo ad un Aris e quali e un po' più di che va, ha la sua movie che va da un po' più forte. Let's start with the law. The law facilitates and constrains computer code. That is, for example, the law facilitates by setting up a register that is based on a blockchain that is computer code. But then the law may also constrain computer code and, for example, allow or prohibit the use of AI by a court, by a judge to establish the judgment. The code then might actually create challenges for the law. For example, the AI capabilities that um, I have just presented may provide a challenge to the law and ask the lawmakers whether they need to adjust the law. We might also use algorithms and code to better understand the law, and this may then shape the law and give it another structure. <coughs> So this is the cooperative view on law and code. Now, when we research law and we want to understand what law, what technology does for such research, it is helpful to think about what law really does. I would like to suggest that ultimately law is a mechanism to influence good decisions or to support good decisions. How does the law do this? It does it by facilitating things and constraining others. For example, the law sets up a register for land and a register for businesses. And you can then register your right in the land and um, you can establish a business, and it would be very difficult to do so without the law establishing these registers. But then the law also constrains you. For example, if you're a director of a company, it tells you what things you cannot do. Or if you want to create rights in land, then it tells you which rights you can create and what you cannot create. Does technology matter for this? I think yes. I think technology influences the essential parts of decision making, and that is information and the decision making pro uh, the decision making process itself. Uh, 
Technology gives us better information so we can take better decisions. But it also helps us in the decision can help us in the decision making process itself, for example by predicting the results of our decisions. Um, on the way that artificial intelligence can predict the outcome of this uh, so this is a specific way in, in which technology supports decision making in the area of dispute resolution. Uh, and concretely, um, What are the studies that are available? The first study, 2004, Gruber and others created a competition between an AI, and that was a very simple AI in the form of an expert system, and 83 legal experts. Uh, the expert system and the experts were asked to predict all decisions of the US Supreme Court in one year, 2002 to 2003. The expert system only had six types of information. The circuit of origin of the case. The issue area of the case, that means whether it was a criminal law case or a civil law case. The type of the petitioner, for example, an employee or the United States or an employer. Fourth, the type of respondent. The ideological direction of the lower court ruling, that is whether the lower court was rather a liberal or a conservative court. And sixth and last, whether the petitioner argued that the law or practice was unconstitutional. The AI, the expert system, did not have the facts and did not have the law. Still, the expert system achieved an, an accuracy prediction of 75%, whereas the experts only achieved a 59% accuracy. In 2017, Katz and others tried to replicate um, those results and they applied an AI algorithm 28,000 decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court. 
So this is the all the US court, US Supreme Court decisions between 1816 and 2015. The AI in that case had access to more meta factors of the type that I have explained, but again the AI did not have access to the facts nor to the law. In this case, the AI then achieved an accuracy in its prediction of 70%, which roughly replicated the Uber study 75% prediction accuracy. In 2016, Aletras and others um, applied an AI algorithm to around 600 decision of the, decisions of the European Court of Human Rights. In this case, the AI had the facts of the cases and a little bit of the law. Um, this study also used a support vector machine, which is a mathematical procedure to, to improve the separation of data classes. Um, if the AI had only the facts, then it achieved an accuracy of 79%. Um, when it had a little bit of the law, then the accuracy was a little bit lower. And then in 2017, there was the case crunch study where I was involved. And in this case, as reported, the AI achieved 87%, while the AI had access to the facts, but not to the law. Now, I'd like to mention that I'm using the term AI very widely in this presentation. Some computer experts would tell me that, that uh, a machine can never be intelligent, it can only engage in machine learning. I'm using the term AI, however, because this is the term that is generally used in, in the discussion, and even those who criticize that machines cannot be intelligent then use that term when entering into discussion. Now looking at the studies, um, a colleague and I got interested in understanding what they tell us about the capacity of AI uh, at the present day. 
So Ludwig Kuhl cool and I, we, um, in a paper published in 2018, we identified two types of cases where we think AI is particularly strong um, at the present time. We think that AI currently is very strong in technical cases and in cases that we call complex cases. To be successful in a technical case, there needs to be a clear and simple legal question, there need to be many cases, and there need to be similar cases with clear patterns. If these characteristics are present, the AI will be successful. If one of them is not present, for example, if there are not many cases, or if the question is not clear and simple, the AI will be less successful. The complex case is the AI will be successful if there is wide discretion by the decision makers, if technical knowledge is less relevant, and then meta factors become more relevant. Think the US Supreme Court cases. In those cases, the experts were not so successful, the human experts, because their technical and legal knowledge was not very helpful for them. What the judges were rather doing was they were deciding ethical questions, political questions, for which the technical legal, legal knowledge was not that relevant, and this is why the human expert has had problems where the AI seems to be quite capable in predicting such outcomes. A good example for the technical cases is the PPI cases that we, that we use in the competition. These are very simple cases with very little variation and we have thousands of such cases available to train the AI. Uh, 
Now, we've discussed decisions, but thinking about our fundamental issues on research in law, a decision is only the first step. The next step is implementation. In practice, when you have a court decision or an ombudsman decision or a contract, this is not what you ultimately want. What you ultimately want is your contract partner to do what they ultimately promise to do. But there's a gap. There is an enforcement gap. Often, court judgments are not implemented, and onward decisions are not implemented, and contracts are not the exposed effect of this is that there is a frustration of the law. You don't get what you were promised. But there is an ex ante effect of this as well. If you know that in a contract there is a chance that later you will not get what you have been promised, you might not enter into this contract in the first place. And this reduces welfare in the state. Here it is where blockchain and smart contracts could be a solution. Just a quick spotlight on corporate insolvency. Here the details don't matter. What matters are the numbers in the red circles. For Germany, a study found that 61% of all assets available in insolvency would go to satisfy the cost of the proceeding. For England, another study found that 38% and 49% 49% respectively of all value available was spent on satisfying the cost of the procedure. And for corporate insolvency in the US, we've got figures of 9%. 38%, 45%, and 25%. That means of all assets available are just used to pay those administrating the insolvency. Uh, for the 
So this means in many, many states we're spending a lot of money just to administer a procedure, but the money we spend does not go to those who ultimately have a claim against the company. This is where blockchain and smart contracts could help. A blockchain is based on a distributed database, also called a decentralized ledger. Everyone participating in the blockchain has access to its entire content, both present and past events. So the, the blockchain is based on a decentralized structure. There is no single entity that is in control of the data. Instead, every party can check whether a transaction corresponds to the data in the distributed ledger. All parties can communicate directly with each other. There are no intermediaries. Parties participating in the blockchain can be both anonymous or they can be identified. Now why is the blockchain called the blockchain? This has to do with the permanent entries. Entries in the blockchain cannot be reversed, they are permanent. Each transaction in the blockchain is linked to the transaction before, and this is why it is called a blockchain. The blockchain also offers an attractive interface for other technology. The fact that the blockchain is based on technology means that digital applications can use and relate to the information in the blockchain. And this is where the smart contract comes in. A smart contract can be drafted, for example, in a way that a party A automatically transfers a certain sum of money to party B if a defined event such as delivery has or has not happened by a certain date. Um, 
And this is why blockchains and smart contracts are so relevant for justice. They allow consequences and enforcement to be automated ex ante. The parties do not need to go to court anymore and then get a court decision and then, then go through the process of enforcement um, to get what they are owed. Instead, the legal consequences and the transfer of a certain right can be automated uh, by the smart contract related to the blockchain. And now imagine how insolvency, corporate insolvency, could be organized without a court, without a legal proceeding as we know it today, but rather by ex ante automated contracts that assign rights and payouts in the case of, of insolvency by way of a smart contract. Now, we've talked a lot about products, tech products. But we also think that it is not just products that will change. But also the institutions of law. That is contracts, companies and courts for example. To give you one example, um, together with a colleague, Martin Petrin of University College London, um, I'm researching and organizing uh, a conference on the future of the firm, the impact of technology, innovation and industrial change in London. Uh, it takes place on the 5th of July and should you be in London, you're very much welcome. Please let me know. To give you an example or two examples of what we're interested in. Economic research tells us, tell us that firms are a reaction to transaction costs, and that means that the size of firms depends on the cost of organizing and implementing contracts. Now, if the organization and implementation of contracts and the organization of firms will change as a result of technology, then maybe firms will become larger or smaller, or they, may, they, they might try to change their structure. Another example is the question, how will firms change if their decisions are only uh, made by AI algorithms? What if it is not humans making decisions for a company, but it is only an AI algorithm? 
Then I think universities are not just there to analyze and describe. That is, I do not think that a good university education is only descriptive. With descriptive, I mean describing what technology does to law, analyzing what technology, how, it, how technology impacts the law, or explaining the results of technology in the law. In addition, I think universities need to engage in normative research and teaching. With normative elements, I mean elements that evaluate what technology does to the law and its practice, and to think about prescriptive research, that is, describing solutions to the challenges technology creates. The terms of research, I think that thinking about good use of technology, uh, thinking about where technology can support welfare, but also where technology might, might be a challenge and even an obstacle to good living is important and it should feature in the research that we do at university. Uh, 